Um, so it's it's now my, uh, my my great pleasure to introduce Karen Chapel, a professor of city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she received her PhD from Berkeley in, in 2000, taught here at the Humphrey School for two years, uh, before then going back to her alma mater to, uh, to teach. She holds the Friesen Chair uh, in Urban Studies at Berkeley and is the recipient of too many awards to list and the author of too many publications to list, except for uh, also she's a, a book author and um, this is her second book and most recent one that has just come out called Transit Oriented Displacement or Community Dividends. It's an examination of understanding uh, the effects of smarter growth on communities. Um, and uh, and Karen and I, uh, during her brief time uh, at, uh, at Minnesota, uh, collaborated on the study of the impact of the Land Use Planning Act and why it seemed to produce so little affordable housing over a 25 year period. And, um, and we have collaborated since then. She is the uh, founder and uh, chief faculty research lead of the Urban Displacement Project uh, probably the most comprehensive university-based research center working on issues of gentrification and displacement uh, in the country uh, that, quote, aims to understand and describe the nature of gentrification and displacement and to generate knowledge on how policy interventions and investment can respond and support more equitable development. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, her talk today. Um, so please uh, join me in greeting uh, Professor Karen Chapel. Thanks, uh, Ed and Tom, and thank you all for coming to the talk. I'm uh, appreciative of it. I know that many of you would have been up at the lake on a beautiful Friday for going up there, so I hope you have a good trip after my talk. Um, and it's great to be back uh, at the Humphrey Institute, giving me lots of memories and thinking about that study with on the uh, Land Use Planning Act was with Barbara Lookerman, who was just such a wonderful uh, woman. And um, then here, seeing a few collaborators and folks like Will um, Craig and folks that we that I knew at the time. So it, it's a wonderful trip back and also an educational trip because my gosh, has this city changed in 18 years. Um, it's not my first time back, uh, but I don't get back as often as I would like. Um, so I'm going to talk about our, our research on gentrification and displacement and with a focus on really how we have um, disseminated it in, t in order to move the policy needle. Um, and um, yeah, also talk about how we're beginning to incorporate big data and predictive analytics into the project. So uh, this is a uh, view of where we're going. Um, we'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of um, predicting urban change, um, and then the big data piece, and then we'll talk some about policy. And then uh, it, I'd like to talk a little bit about commercial and industrial displacement, which don't get nearly as much attention, but are really interesting phenomena and understudied. So our work is building on actually um, a legacy of uh, what we would call neighborhood early warning systems. And uh, this is a, a shot of um, what I believe was the first one, um, which was at the Center for Neighborhood Technology in Chicago, which at that time, uh, I think this was beginning in the 90s, early 90s that they put this out, um, that this, they were trying to look at uh, predict decline and abandonment. Um, they were really looking at disinvestment in order um, to really uh, pinpoint uh, areas where people were at risk from disinvestment and were, uh, could be losing their house um, to arson or, or, and being displaced. Um, this focus on warning um, shifted dramatically in the 2000s to where we're looking uh, more at risk of investment 
um, with the idea that um, areas um, that are gentrifying could be putting uh, their residents at risk uh, of displacement. And so this is um, a map um, that our colleague um, Lisa Bates did in Portland State, um, and uh, very, she was very influential in the recent report that Ed and his group did at Cura. Wonderful report on gentrification, which you should read if you haven't. Um, there's other examples uh, of this too around the country, and I'm not going to show you all. I, I have an article on this called Forewarned, which is looking at um, a, a variety of these different um, GIS uh, um, projects. So this is one in New York, um, which is really quite marvelous um, displacement action project map done by ANHD, um, Association of Neighborhood um, and Housing Development. Um, ANHD, you can find it. Um, this is, they've assembled an amazing data set, building by building, looking at uh, permits, building code violations, sales, um, in order to uh, come up with an indicator of risk. Um, and uh, they have a what they call a, a speculation watch list, where you can uh, get get ideas uh, about where speculation, where buildings have been sold, and are are of the character um, uh, to be flipped into in, uh, into higher income housing. Uh, not all folks use maps for good. Some use for. Um, their own profit, and so uh, this is a, a one of a set of maps looking at uh, where you could invest in in um, cities. So, um, so these maps are used for all all kinds of reasons. Um, we have our maps, and you can see them um, at urban displacement. Dot org. Um, we we have them up in public, actually. Um, just uh, for a very simple reason. We did this study of, uh, of gentrification near uh, transit stations in uh, California, and we found that many different community groups were emailing us asking for our maps, and we got so tired of responding to every email with another JPEG that we said we're just going to put up our uh, maps online, and that was how the urban displacement project uh, started. I turned to my partner, who's a web developer, and I said, look, can we get urbandisplacement.org? And he said, yes, so we did it. And we were off and running, and suddenly we had a project. Um, and we had to give it legs. Um, and so we've been gradually building it out. Uh, this, is, this, is, this work is not funded, actually. We, do, uh, <laughs> we have a set of studies that we do that fund our, our work, and, uh, but the, the interface itself is something we just do out of love. Um, and one of the interesting things, though, was that the, it, it really changed the nature of research for me. I've always done community-engaged research. Um, but suddenly, I was doing community-engaged research on a global scale, um, not, not for Oakland or, or Minneapolis, but uh, you know, I'd have users from all over the world contacting me. So a uh, very different kind of dynamic and very interesting uh, to deal with. And, so at this point, we get about um, 10,000 individual users visiting uh, per month. Um, so we get a fair amount of, uh, of traffic on the site. Um, but I want to rewind and talk a little bit about how we got interested in this kind of research. And it was really about, um, my, a lot of my research is on regional planning. I'm very interested in regional sustainability planning. And uh, so we were thinking in the Bay Area um, about how we would house the next two million residents and, uh, and one million jobs. And we were doing this because uh, the state of California has a, a state law called SB 375, which, which requires its MPOs to, look, to do regional planning in order to hit uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. So we have every region in California has a set of targets to hit, and, um, and the way to do it 
is to, to pack people in. So for, in uh, the Bay Area, we want to put 80% of new growth into 5% of the land area. And that's going to give us a pretty good bang for the buck. And it's already started um, to do so. Uh, the issue, however, is, uh, is displacement is what happens to the existing residents when we're planning for the two million to come. Um, and this is a, a young man in a, uh, whose family was evicted from this building, as were all of the uh, other 40 uh, uh, households in the building. Um, and the surprise here um, was actually um, where he was being evicted from. He was in a, a um, suburb called Red, uh, Redwood City, which is, um, I don't know, maybe comparable to Roseville, uh, in not the most glamorous suburb outside of San Francisco, a working class town. Nobody would have ever dreamed that it was going to gentrify. Um, but Redwood City, it has a Caltrain station there. Um, and it is a direct <coughs> shot for workers going to either San Francisco or Silicon Valley to work. And it was putting tremendous pressure on the housing market. So uh, the evictions have started to pick up. And this is, this is actually for, from a few years ago. And it continues to this day that we're, we're seeing um, act, pressures on, on uh, what we thought were stable, affordable housing markets in the suburbs um, that, that we would never have anticipated. Um, and it's, it's, it's because of accessibility and proximity to jobs and so forth. Um, and the issue is that if, if we are going to have a displacement problem, um, it, it kind of puts at risk uh, California's whole strategy for greenhouse gas reductions and uh, you know adapting to climate change. Uh, so the state hired us, uh, the California Air Resources Board hired us then um, to figure out how to help them figure out um, how to measure displacement that was uh, occurring near, near transit. Um, and uh, so we, we began this work. And you know, the state got involved because the state didn't want to get sued. Um, so uh, it was nervous about that. And so it had to you know, show that it was doing something. Um, so um, that, that was not conflicting with its, with its housing goals. So we jumped into the study. And um, we, we began, of course, by looking at where we were coming from in this area of gentrification and displacement. And we found kind of a hodgepodge of studies. Um, so one of the things that we quickly noticed was sort of a fuzziness about how we use the terms gentrification and displacement. Now, you can uh, agree um, that, and I do agree that gentrification basically um, is displacement in the sense that, you, by definition, um, there's some sort of, um, uh, once you have an upper income uh, influx, um, an influx of capital, that you, you lose some of, uh, of, of the original character of the area. Um, and this is what a lot of folks have said for years, gentrification and displacement um, are the same thing. But in reality, and if you're going to operationalize them, they're actually two different things. And so this is where we started our project, was by saying, well, we're going to look at gentrification as an increase in high educated, high income residents, and we're going to look at, uh, at an influx of capital um, in the form of, of uh, development or housing prices. Um, and we're going to look at displacement as simply where, um, where when a household is forced to move. And this made it cleaner for us from a data perspective, because we could measure one thing and we could measure the other thing. But it was also actually a very important political step, um, because, um, uh, because no politician can get up there and say, displacement's good, don't worry about it. And you can say, well, voluntary displacement's not a problem. 
Um, but we don't always know what's voluntary and what's involuntary. So, so it, 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 displacement turns out to be kind of an umbrella that um, that a lot of different stakeholders can unite behind. Whereas gentrification tends to uh, um, divide people. Um, some people, you know, in underinvested areas, would like to see some gentrification, and you can argue forever about whether it's positive or negative. We didn't want to get into that debate, so that's why we. We separated the two, and it worked better for our data, too. So that was the first thing we found. Um, the second thing that we kept seeing in the literature was a really fuzzy relationship between gentrification and displacement. And um, <coughs> oh, well, I would say that, that there was actually, there's actually a whole group of researchers. They're mostly economists. And they have tried to do a set of studies um, that show that there's little, uh, a very little relationship between gentrification and displacement. And um, so this, and they've actually been quite convincing, and they've been dominated the debate to a certain extent. And I'm talking about Ingrid Goldellen and Lance Freeman, um, and a few others. Um, and um, they have actually very convincing models that say, look, here's gentrification, and we can't find evidence of exits or displacement um, at the end of the process. Um, and so we looked at those models, and, um, and we, 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 we began questioning them. Um, first of all, from how they kind of measure gentrification and displacement, because they didn't do make, make quite the distinctions that we had. But also the time frame that they would look at was, for instance, 1990 to 2000. And if you've lived in a neighborhood for, say, um, you know, a number of years, you know that 10 years is really nothing in the life of a neighborhood that change is really slow. Change can go, uh, incremental change can happen for decades and then suddenly it will change. But it, so there's a uh, arrhythmic quality to change um, and there's also an extended quality to change and these decade studies were not really capturing it. Um, and then we, we've, we started realizing from, from interviews, which I'll talk about, uh, later, that that actually these models that the economists were using were actually misspecified. That the reason they weren't finding displacement as a result of gentrification is because the displacement happened before the gentrification. So they had they needed to flip the sides, and um, and they, so they they were missing it because by the time the gentrification happened. Place have been cleared out, um, and this happens in neighborhood after neighborhood, whether it's urban renewal or a, an incremental uh, process of, of evictions and, and um, dis, dis uh, enfranchisement. So, uh, so that that was a, a, a big finding for us, and made us realize we need to find other ways of uh, thinking about this rather than those kind of traditional regression models. Um, and then finally, we, we had an interest in public investment in particular and transit, because that was what we were hired to look at. And what we um, realized is that, um, that most of the folks looking at uh, gentrification hadn't looked at public investment. Um, there's, if you go through the literature, you'll see that very few are talking, look at transit, or look at bikeways, or look at parks, or look at school quality, or other, any kinds of indicators of where public money is going um, to see how that might be uh, spurring neighborhood change. So, um, so we really wanted to go back and, and, and look at that. So, um, I'm, uh, so this is our, the sorts of data that we put together. Um, I love, 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 love data. So, um, and what, what we did here is we built a, a what I call multi-level model going from parcel level to track level um, to city level with three different, with different types of variables. We would have something uh, like uh, at the individual level we would have permits and evictions. Um, uh, or businesses um, at the census tract level. We have, of course, census data. And then at the city level, we had a set of policy variables we could look at. So I'm going to talk um, briefly about our, um, our mapping and how we constructed indicators um, to, to think about displacement and gentrification. 
in the Bay Area region. So we started um, with a simple displacement indicator. So we, we, we compiled three different displacement indicators in our work. And this is the first one, which is a simple measure, which is, you can do this at home with the census data. Um, so it's just the change in low-income households. Um, and so in most strong market regions, you're seeing a gradual increase in, in low-income households because we, as a country, are experiencing a trend of income inequality, and that's being imprinted on our regions. So most of our um, areas, like New York, Boston, I think Minneapolis, too, are growing at both poles, high income and very low income. And we, we use a measure of um, where, where your, if your neighborhood is actually gaining low-income households, and then we say, well, that something, something, uh, uh, um, what, so on, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. On average, your, your, your neighborhood is gaining low-income households because of this kind of national trend. If, you're, if your neighborhood is actually losing no low-income households, then you, um, you must be experiencing some form of dis displacement. You're bucking the trend. And indeed, when we mapped that, we found that uh, many of the core areas here in red and orange uh, were actually losing low-income households. The second indicator we used to look at um, displacement was the loss of naturally occurring affordable housing. So this is housing that's affordable at 30% of the of income, of low-income households. <clears throat> so this is the, the um, you know, typically it had been market rate housing stock and it filtered down over time. We know about filtering as houses get older, they decline in quality and also in price. And so that becomes naturally occurring uh, affordable housing. And it's actually the greatest source of our um, affordable housing in this country is trickle down. Well, it, 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 we looked at where those trickle down units weren't, weren't trickling down. <laughs> Uh, and it turns out that we've lost a couple hundred thousand uh, units uh, to filtering up instead. Instead of uh, staying uh, affordable to low-income households, they are now only affordable to high-income households. So those are the ones in, in red and orange as well. Our third indicator we look at in all of our work is exclusion, exclusionary displacement, which is a term that Peter Marcuse came up with in, in his work on displacement, which is still like the pivotal work on displacement, and it's from the 1980s. Uh, so that's how far this field has moved um, in 30 years. But, we're, um, but he really um, thought it through in a way that nobody else has since, which is uh, you know, that the, the displacement is also not being able to move into a place. Um, and so if you look at patterns of exclusion, if you look at where low-income households can move in the region, and that's the, uh, the areas in dark blue, um, in our region, um, they can move to um, uh, the excerpts way out there. We're talking past the um, affluent excerpts to the more rural areas, or they can, um, their areas in the inner city and uh, the, the older entering suburbs that are where folks are, are able to move. So we, so we had these three indicators that we, we looked at um, and, um, and looked at their relationship um, to transit. Um, and uh, as it turned out, uh, there was a, there, there's a mixed relationship between transit and, and displacement. Um, um, there is actually a fair amount of stability in the core areas of the city because that's where we have built most of our subsidized housing. So a lot of the displacement that's happening in our region happens uh, within cities. P people move out of one neighborhood into, into another nearby because that's where they can find subsidized housing. Um, and then we looked at gentrification, and so we, again, this was simply defined as, as an increase in high-income, high-educated households and the influx of capital, and so the areas of red here are gentrified. There's quite an uh, association with the location of transit, um, but again, it's mixed, and one of the lessons we got from this 
project was that, um, and this is in the book as well, is that e e context matters tremendously. That we, we, you can't just build a transit station and say, oh, it's going to gentrify the area, and sooner or later everybody's going to be displaced. No, unfortunately. Um, in some areas, yes. In some areas, not. It sort of depends on, on the amenities around the station. It depends on micro factors, like whether you put, uh, whether you have, uh, you know, your bike share next to the station and uh, a lot of amenities for people to use and, uh, and you know, dozens of, uh, of, uh, of environmental factors that we, we really haven't found a good way to, to measure yet. So. Um, so, so we aren't. Uh, so we, we can't just say that there's going to be if there's transit, there's going to be gentrification. It's way more complicated than that. But that's just the research. I want to go back to the mapping and the impact and uh, the fun part. So, um, so what we did, we, we again we put up our maps and um, and we've adopted this um, system of thinking about cities where we map our low income areas that are experiencing gentrification um, and, and or displacement. We map them in purple, the darker purple or the ones that are gentrified. Um, the, the orange areas are the moderate to high income areas that are experiencing displacement. So the darker orange means that you have an exclusive area where low-income households are not able to move in anymore. And so we really wanted to put these affluent areas on the map you know, for, for decades as researchers interested in neighborhood change and poverty. We had all concentrated just on the low-income areas and just made it made the higher income areas invisible. And we, we sort of made a political decision here. We're gonna we're gonna highlight what's going on in the richer areas as well. And and we found that actually there are quite a few areas where low income households uh, used to live and don't anymore. So um, so this is this has been a uh, um, an interesting experience for us. And then the, the, the uh, types that are, are or hash, hatched in orange, um, purple and orange, those are the ones that have been gentrifying for over 25 years. So those are the long term, we call them advanced uh, gentrified cases. So we, um, as I mentioned, we, we, we talked to people too to, in this research project and we felt, felt like building in uh, community feedback was a really critical um, point and is how we kind of understood that those gentrification models had been all wrong. So we worked with eight or nine different community groups. Uh, we, we walked around the blocks with them. We ground truthed our data. They checked our parcel data for us. They came up with their own narratives of the neighborhood. Um, and we have case studies on, on our website um, which are about those results. But we, we had some really important learnings, I think, from those case studies. And you can see we, we distribute them across our region. Um, so one of the things we, we learned uh, was that these, these places were connected, that we started to see chains of displacement uh, occurring. Um, where we would we would learn, you know, that oh my mom lived in the Mission District, but we moved to Redwood City in 1995, and we've been here ever since. And so now we just got evicted, and we're and we're, we're moving uh, out even further to East Palo Alto. So we the the region is connected in a way. So displacement in, in one com community um, has ripple effects down downstream um, in in the rest of the region. So you can't really think about. Um, you know, individual neighborhood uh, housing markets. And this was important because, you know, when we think about gentrification, we tend to think about uh, single neighborhoods. You know, for decades and decades, the research was just one neighborhood at a time. You know, we had Society Hill in Philadelphia. We had um, Soho and then the East Village, West Village and then the East Village in New York. In, in San Francisco, it was all about the Mission District and nobody wanted to talk about gentrification elsewhere. And so that left places like Redwood City um, off the map. And we, um, yet what was going on in the Mission was definitely affecting these other places. Um, and, um, and not only that, what we realized in our interviews was that developers in the outlying places 
we're thinking about the, ho the housing market regionally. It's not just planners, it's not just those guys at the MPO that we all love to hate. Um, it's actually um, the, the capitalism, you know, the actors uh, in the private sector in the housing market are thinking about, are thinking about uh, the entire housing market as a region. And just as an illustration, I take this um, apartment building in um, Concord, uh, which is a, uh, if you can see on the map, it's an outlying suburb. It's on the transit line. It's on our BART line, um, but a little bit uh, of a distance and almost a mile walk from the station. Um, so um, uh, a little bit outside uh, of, of a transit-oriented development, but still uh, walkable um, from transit. And um, we talked to um, this developer, and I, I named this case Displacement with Gentrification Nowhere in, in Plain Sight, um, because here, yeah, we went there, we thought, well, nothing's going on here. You know, our census data didn't show anything happening in the area. And then we talked to the developer um, and the, the landlord of the building who said to us, we market to a lot of art writers, I call them the laptop crowd. We've radically modified the population since we took it over. At that time, it was 99% Latino, extended families. We've gotten rid of all that market. We've gotten rid of all the excessive occupation units. He's talking about overcrowding, um, uh, overcrowded units. And he said, said to us, I'm thinking that the time will come when market prices will sustain a price level here that will make it irresistible for us to no longer run it as a rental operation. Meaning, he's going to convert it to condos the first chance he gets. And he's waiting. And we asked him about his time frame. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I don't think it's going to happen this business cycle. We're talking like the 2013, 14, 15 to, to now, but he said, probably by the next cycle, by the time my son takes over the building, we're going to be able to, to convert it. So he's already emptying out the building and, uh, and, and uh, you know, displacing with the idea of the gentrification that he will um, uh, profit from down the road. Um, so it's, I always tell my students now, after having talked to a bunch of these developers, you know, learn to think like a developer. It's, you know, you'll thank yourself. It's the most important thing you can do. Um, also, in this vein, um, we, we, more recently, we've, been, we've started working with high school um, students to think about displacement, and actually as a way of getting them comfortable with doing mapping and GIS and even data science. Um, we work with the Center for Cities and Schools, which is, is at Berkeley, um, which has helped us do, uh, uh, you know, build a curriculum to work with, with the students. And um, we found that actually um, talking to students uh, about uh, the housing crisis is a way to really get them engaged in, in data. So this is uh, not, uh, from a story mapping project we did in East Palo Alto next to the uh, Facebook uh, campus um, and where they're just really, really challenged housing conditions. So we had them interview um, their, their families and their friends about displacement and housing conditions. And here's an example of an interviewee who says, I live in a four bedroom, four bath house. A family lives in the garage. There are five families in this house. Um, and we put this on, on, on a, in a story map on our website. So this is um, this is data that we would never have captured had we just stuck to our census data. None, none of this would, would show up. Probably, it's quite probable that this family was undocumented and didn't answer the census, but even if, uh, even some of the documented folks are not going to report these types of conditions because they're afraid of repercussions. Um, so uh, this is making us kind of want to go back and find other ways um, to measure uh, measure overcrowding um, through different data sources. Uh, I just want to touch on uh, New York. Um, this is our, our partners that uh, work in New York. We reduced we re released our New York maps last week, and we we've added a few things to them. Um, we've added public housing, which it turns out has a really interesting relationship um, with gentrification and exclusion. So. Public housing seems to stabilize um, the areas. They're all in, uh, you know, most of the areas around public housing are, are low income, and oh, very few are actually gentrifying. 
Um, and uh, one of the other things we've added here, which was super interesting, was opportunity zones. And it turns out that there's a, uh, a very strong relationship uh, between gentrifying areas and opportunity zones. There's also some very interesting opportunity zones in exclusive areas or areas that gentrified a long time ago, like Dumbo uh, in Brooklyn. So I want to move on to talk a little bit about our data, our methodological challenges, and why we've sort of started to look at Twitter data and big data, um, what we call user-generated geographic information. So we, we, we've we had this problem with our regression models when we, when we try to predict um, gentrification. Um, we'll get, so about 10% of tracks in, in both San Francisco and New York, and a lot of the areas we've looked at actually, it's all, it tends to come up around 10% of the tracks have gentrified. And we can predict those, we can predict about 90% of those tracks quite accurately. Um, but when we try to predict um, uh, the ones that aren't going to gentrify, we, we tend to get false positives. Um, in other words, we, we have these, we, we map these, uh, we, we have these areas that we think are all at risk of gentrification, but actually very few of them end up gentrifying. And um, it's, it's kind of a problem, and we, uh, you know, gentrification is actually quite rare, um, and um, there are whole areas of our cities that are just getting poorer. Um, and we, if we call them, if we say these are at risk of gentrification, then everybody's going to mobilize to stop the development and investment in the area, but, but maybe that area wasn't going to gentrify and maybe that investment would have helped. So we, we, we need to get better, uh, better at predicting where gentrification will, put, will happen and where displacement will happen and uh, where there's actually a risk um, to, to kind of bring some sense to this debate, um, which has gotten very, very politicized everywhere in the country. So we've moved to Twitter data. So this is our Twitter data. Um, let me tell you about this uh, data set. Um, this has been a super fun exploration into data science. So we have a data set of three years of geotagged um, tweets. Geotagged tweets are about 1% of the total number of tweets. And um, this, uh, this map is ma mapping actually 1% of that 1% because um, you can't show the, all of our, our data set. It's, it's too huge. We have 54 million tweets uh, for the three years for the, for the Bay Area. So it's a lot of uh, cells. Uh, so a lot of records. So so we take, I'm just showing you a little sample of our data. What we've been doing with this work um, is is try is first of all making a calculation of, of who's uh, who's a local and who's an outsider basically. So the ones in red and orange there are locals. Those are people walking around their house or going uh, to the next tract over to uh, for to for a moment. Um, and the ones in blue are the ones that are from outside uh, outside the area that uh, that live outside. Um, of the area. And you can see the blue better if I take away the orange or red, and you can see where these people are. Here's where all of them are, and you can see this is a concentration downtown, as you would expect, and you would have a similar map for Minneapolis, I'm sure, with the financial district. But with the ones from outside, you can see, actually, they're tweeting on the highways. You can see the highways outlined here. Um, so they're driving down you know, 101, 280, the interstate, the, the big avenue, 19th. Um, they're, they're driving and tweeting. Or maybe their passengers are tweeting. But anyway, these are the folks from outside. So we wanted to see what we could, under, what, what we could understand about activity in a neighborhood um, from this sample of people that come there and, and tweet. Um, so it's, a, it's really a different way of looking um, at, at neighborhood activity. And we think it may be um, a, a good predictor of a neighborhood that's going to change. There's been some research on this in Chicago. One of my colleagues who worked on this with me, Anta Portries, he has looked at uh, the relationship between tweeting and housing prices in Chicago and found that you could actually predict. Uh, housing price changes in the short term uh, based on, on uh, activity from, from folks coming in to tweet. Um, 
So we we uh, we we began to look at this with our data. Um, I'm not going to uh, bore you with the methodology here, but we have an algorithm to calculate um, where people's home is and to sort out the ones that aren't tweeting very often. All the ones in green are the, are the folks that have tweeted less than 20 times. So it's all of us, including me, that get a Twitter account and never use it. Um, we're in the green. Um, and um, then, then the, the ones with blue are the ones that we have, we're able to discern home locations from. Uh, then we take our, um, we clean out power users, so we clean out the folks that's, that um, are tweeting thousands and thousands of times. We have one user in our uh, data set that has tweeted 90,000 times um, over the three years. Uh, we think it's a bot. Um, so you have to clean out your bots and your super users in order to get, uh, you know, so they're not going to dwarf all the other uh, uh, activity, it was too much noise. Um, and then we looked at, we compared, uh, you know, all tweets to tweets that were going on in um, in uh, gentrifying tra tracks to the at-risk tracks. Uh, and we found that that in that the high that the disproportionate share um, in the ongoing gentrification tracks were actually these non-neighbors or outsiders. So indeed, there seems to be a relationship between our how we've characterized uh, gentrification and, and people from outside. Um, so then you can do all sorts of things. Once you know where people uh, come from, where their home locations are, you can you get some sort of demographic characteristics of your tweeters, and you can see where they go and uh, where 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 they are traveling during the day, which is something that we, we really can't get with census data. So this is just a quick uh, portrait. This is a little side story here uh, of where the where people go to tweet. So. This is uh, the darker red or there where, um, where people from more affluent neighborhoods, um, when they leave their neighborhood, they go, they go and tweet in places that are also affluent. Like here we have Marin County in San Francisco and the suburbs. Uh, poor people actually tweet in the lower income uh, communities in the core. Um, you can look at high educated people uh, where they go to tweet, they go to Berkeley to tweet. <laughs> Apparently, there's a concentration there. Um, we can look at this by race, um, and we can we see some peripheral dramatic patterns again uh, uh, by race of, of activity um, in the outskirts of the region. Um, if you contrast this with African Americans, you can see a very very high concentrated pattern of, uh, of activity in in very few areas of the region. This is really quite striking and something we should look at. Anyway, we're using these outsider tweets now as an additional risk factor to kind of um, tweak our, our traditional analyses we did with all those other uh, data sources we had. And now we can use this. And it tends to pull up kind of different places that, that you wouldn't uh, think of, some of the suburbs that are, are um, experiencing stress in their, um, in their housing markets. Okay, so now I'm going to go to policy um, and uh, to wrap up here, um, and uh, we might have a little more time. Okay, um, am I good for 20 minutes more? Or? Okay, okay, then we'll talk about policy, and then we'll talk a, a little bit about commercial and industrial gentrification. Um, so. One of the pieces uh, we did here um, as part of our work uh, to look at um, neighborhood change around transit is we began inventorying um, all the cities in California and the two regions we were looking at, which were the Bay Area and Los Angeles, all of their anti-displacement policies. And then uh, we did. Uh, uh, we, we, we came up with a list of eight that we could easily research across places, and then we threw it on the map. And so the darker blue here are the good cities, and the light blue are the bad cities in terms of um, uh, uh, anti-displacement policies. Um, and so things like condo conversion ordinances, um, or rent control, or other types of uh, tenant protections. And um, 
So one of the interesting things we found immediately after we threw this up on the map was that um, city councils were using this um, all over the region. So we had city councils didn't know, you don't know, like, what does the next city over have? You know, we don't have that information. We don't know who's doing what. There's no kind of central database. Um, it all has to be gathered painstakingly. And so we, when we did it and we visualized it and people could see, oh, those guys actually have eight policies and we only have two, they were kind of shamed. Um, so we, we actually saw some movement around new policies and, and um, this was at the time there were, were uh, rent control measures actually. After we put up our maps, we found uh, three or four uh, new cities in the, in the uh, Silicon Valley put up um, rent control initiatives on, on the ballot. So this is something I would do here if I were you. Um, this, is, this would be really fun to do for the Twin Cities um, and see what happens. Oh, right. Um, so, what, so what policies did we look at? Well, there are so many policies, and it's just hard to know even where to start to think about it. So as we were starting to our, organize our thoughts, we came up with a, a bunch of different frameworks. This is one framework that I use all the time, which is uh, thinking about law and, and development remedies. So these are short-term saving buildings, saving tenants, um, crisis kind of mentality, uh, reactive. Um, then there's citywide and state policies that can be put into place um, to, um, pr to, to really to preserve the housing units um, and produce uh, new affordable units. And then there's the planning time frames, and these are the 30-year time frames, the 2040 plans. And, um, and, and there are many, many different mechanisms that we can be using in our plans that I think we don't make enough strategic use of to ensure that our children and grandchildren are going to be able to stay in these neighborhoods. Um, so, and then the punchline here is that you really have to think um, across all these uh, dimensions of time. You have to think short term, you have to think mid term, you have to think long term. Um, because if you're just, if you're just putting out fires, um, you're going to look up in 30 years and, and a lot of um, the people that used to live here um, will not have the choice to do so anymore. So, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, I, my, my comment here is always like, this is, this is like climate change, right? You don't say, well, let's do wind, um, let's not do solar. It's, let's not bother, let's just do wind power. Um, you say, let's do everything. We have to do everything in our, in our power to mitigate the crisis. So, and it's really, really hard because we're all organized in silos. We have the law folks and we have the, the market rate production folks and we have the affordable housing production fo folks and they're all fighting for their uh, piece of the policy program and, um, and it's very hard. Um, to say both and, let's do it all, um, let's collaborate. Um, so, so it's no wonder that our, our governor, our ex-governor Jerry Brown said, well, climate change, that's the, easy policy, that's the easy problem to solve. It's the housing crisis that I've never been able to touch. <laughs> um, so, so it's really, really hard. Um, another way we've been thinking about policy is just in terms of the market versus public investment and whether we want money or housing. <laughs> and so this is, this is a chart that really you know, varies on, on where you are um, and you know, what, so what, what are the resources available to your neighborhood and what are the, what, what, what are the policies and programs you can enact in, in your state. Um, so I was recently giving a similar talk in Austin, and they asked the city of Austin asked for my slides uh, before I, I spoke, um, and, and said, "Do you mind if we edit them?" And they took the they took about half of these policies and crossed them out, big X's through them because you can't do it in the state of Texas. Um, so, uh, so you're not, many contexts you can't, for instance, uh, linkage fees, um, impact fees, inclusionary zoning, um, uh, uh, how you dispose of public land, uh, messing with your parking requirements, a lot of those are, are non-starters for, for certain places. 
Um, but hopefully there are some left that, that can work for, for your community. And um, then we, we also put together a framework to, for thinking about neighborhood um, stabilization strategies. So um, one of the things that became clear to us by just by working in a variety of communities, we realized that some we need to be responsive, reactive, we need to say, put out the fire, we need to save the building where the eviction is happening. And some we need to be preventive, some we need to really be thinking about the 10 years from now when that uh, building is going to have its tenants evicted. So, so some we need to sort of, we need to, again, think in multiple time, uh, time phases at the same time. Um, and then we need to think about not just saving people, but saving saving uh, housing units too um, in, our, in our core areas. Um, so again, lots of lots of work um, to do here um, and um, lots of different approaches that can be taken. We, uh, we found that our work had um, um, they moved the policy needle in some ways. Um, this is a picture that somebody shot at a, a San Jose City Council meeting where a young man um, took our maps and brought them to showed them to the council and said, hey, my neighborhood is changing. My neighborhood is in a state uh, of uh, ongoing gentrification. And um, and next to it, we have a state of displacement. And, and you need to do something about it. So we we found that this is uh, you know this is this is the day and age where we can actually bring information into a debate in real time. So it's very exciting. So beyond that, we also had some impacts on a on a national and local level in, in policies. We had HUD now um, allows an anti-displacement preference for subsidized housing in San Francisco. So if you can show that you've been in one of those purple areas, the dark purple on our map you can get bumped up on the list um, for, for subsidized housing. Um, we have a whole zoning district in the mission which says you cannot build anything unless you discuss displacement. Um, so it's sort of like an environmental review process, um, but adding the social economic uh, components in, which uh, a lot of places do not do in their environmental review. Um, um, and finally, we had uh, new displacement targets that have been adopted in our regional plan. So now we 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 try to reduce the the impacts as we as we think about where we're going to put the housing units 20 years out. We think about um, where are the people at risk that are vulnerable. Okay, so quickly just to to talk about the commercial side, um, we also have um, worked hard to try and um, measure and understand uh, commercial gentrification and displacement. Um, uh, this is just, this is a neighborhood um, in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, uh, Vietnamese uh, neighborhood. And if you see something in this picture that does not belong, um, there's the olive uh, martini bar right there. Um, and this is the sort of the classic image of commercial gentrification. And it, as we've started to talk about gentrification a lot, this is what this is what people actually get even more upset about than residential gentrification in many ways because it feels like a cultural violation of some kind. Often it feels like your neighborhood character is being taken away um, um, by, by new establishments, by having turnover, by losing your mom and pops. So it's something that gets people very upset, um, yet it's very, very hard to, to measure um, exactly what what is uh, you know unless you have good data on when that you know grocery store went out of business and got replaced uh, by this um, empanada bar um, you know you don't it, it's it's uh, it's very hard to do in that aggregate data we've done some work on it we've looked at we had to compare local serving versus regional serving businesses and and uh, where are they, um, how are the trends going? And we can show that, that actually local serving businesses um, are being lost in certain uh, corridors. And then we, we have tried to do this on a regional scale. So we've looked at churn in, um, 
in um, commercial establishments um, and in uh, minority-owned businesses and in um, non-chain businesses and constructed an indicator that, um, that we use to identify commercially gentrified places. Um, this piece of work has been a little frustrating because it's not like there are any easy policy remedies. And you get to this part, and you and and people say, well, what can we do? And then you, if you say commercial rent control, people will laugh you out of the room. So I, I mean, I, even the places that have tried to do it, 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 it has been really hard. I've been I've seen it in New York over the decade. It's been proposed, uh, you know, once every decade or so. There's a new proposal for commercial rent control, and it, it just can't get get off the ground. So. So there's got to be other models, and I'm really interested um, in learning more about models for, for stabilizing um, small businesses. And the last piece I wanted to mention is one that we don't think about uh, much at all, which is industrial gentrification. This is Dumbo in New York, an uh, iconic image of a, uh, you know older loft buildings that have been uh, gentrified into art and, and um, retail establishments. Um, we have done some work uh, mapping the industrial land supply and demand in the in the Bay Area. Um, and by the way, there's a great study in in the Twin Cities of uh, industrial land supply too. There's some great folks. I believe it's at the Met Council who did did some work on this. So. So one of the things, uh, so we worked for the regional government to figure out where was their industrial land. They had no idea where the industrial land is. There is no data on uh, regional zoning. There, there just isn't. You, you have to build it from scratch. Um, there, there, um, uh, and, and then you have, uh, you know, every city has a different zoning code. At least, I, I don't know if it's like this here, but in, in California, Every city is different, so you have to reconcile it across, you have to build a standardized code um, in order to measure industrial land supply. So anyway, we did this for the region. We, we realized that there, was, there are going to be really striking um, industrial land deficits um, in, in 2040 in certain areas, including Silicon Valley, is going to be in the, in the negative um, in terms of uh, industrial land. So you guys should be picking off some of those businesses because uh, you guys still have industrial land uh, left. Um, and, uh, but, and then we have um, a number of different areas that have been um, reprogrammed um, for residential use, so they've already been uh, changed in the comp plans to be residential. So this is really a recipe for displacement, and so we've looked at the jobs that are, are likely to be displaced, and the tens of thousands of jobs uh, will will um, disappear um, as as these areas that are being reprogrammed uh, for residential um, push out the the industrial jobs uh, gradually. So this too, um, we found that our maps, um, you know, putting them online and showing them to uh, boards of supervisors or county, uh, county boards, um, they saw this and they got really worried. So they passed a program at the regional level called Priority Production Areas, which preserves, which allows cities to elect um, to choose areas that they want preserved um, for industrial land use, and they can now qualify for loans and other um, benefits if they designate such an area. So that is what I love to do, is try and make a difference on the ground um, through data. Um, and this is the book. Um, Ed showed you a copy of it. Uh, we got MIT Press to offer it for free. So we don't get any royalties, but we get a little bit better uh, readership. So um, I hope you go and uh, take a look. Thank you. We have some time for uh, questions. Shall we just... Oh, you want yes. to go say? Yes. Are you we'll coming go... with me? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll go to the chairs. And um, we have a little bit of time for uh, questions. We do have like refreshments in the um, uh, in the atrium outside uh, for afterwards. Um, so I guess just raise your hand and speak loudly. Yes. Oh, there's a microphone. You don't have to speak. Loudly. Can we ask you questions too? No. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, hi, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Professor Chapel. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student here in Humphrey School. Um, and I had a question concerning um, research and its impact on policy making. So you've shown us a lot of um, very impressive visuals and I could see like the power they have in, in informing policy making and moving the needles. But I've also seen like a great um, potential that some of them might be misinterpreted by the local officials or the policymakers. Um, and also, you showed your research on like um, estimating the, the possibility that census tract could be gentrified, but there's there turned out to be like only a small portion of them uh, become truth. Um, so I do see that this kind of research, um, some of them might be um, having impact, unexpected impacts on certain neighborhoods, like stopping their investments or um, influencing, influencing local decision making. And at me, myself as a researcher, I've always had this kind of um, dilemma, like I'm, a, I'm the indicator that I'm using capturing an effect that I want to measure well. Is there any possibilities that my sample is distorted? For example, um, the Twitter data you are using can only capture the people's behavior, uh, can only capture its users' behavior, but not those people who do not use Twitter or not be an actively engaged user. Um, so my question is like, how do you see this kind of predicaments, or like, how do you balance it? That's a wonderful uh, set of questions. Um, and I mean, the big, in the big picture, uh, there are huge ethical responsibilities for the researcher, right? And we put up our maps, and yet we know they they may have some problems. Um, so here's so uh, on the. On the, on the ethical responsibilities, here's how I have interpreted it. That he, it, so my job is to uh, you know inform and provoke, and then I'm going to trust that on the ground the debate um, you know there will be enough debate to to that there will be in the democratic process, a way to settle on a, process, a policy that works for the area. So they're not going to you know, jump and pass rent control for those neighborhoods that, uh, that weren't really at risk, right? That be, because people are going to, in the end, come back to their experience um, and vote based on their experience. So, so I'm trusting that that political process can help sort it out. But meanwhile, I'm just trying to fix, fix the problem, right, with more research and get it, get it better and better each time. So that's my ethical responsibility, um, is to do that. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's really hard. And, you know, I think in the past, many researchers have chosen not to share their research. You know, they, they, and part of it's just the way academia is set up, and the ivory tower, and so forth, you have to publish, um, and you have to make it, you know, you have to publish in a certain style that's not accessible to policymakers, and most academics don't even take the time to talk to policymakers. So we've just had a complete disconnect. Um, so we need to start to, to reconnect, um, or connect for the first time, to, to what's happening on the ground. And so, um, so, so, yeah, it's going to have to improve, but hopefully it will get better and better and better, and whether it's in data sources and, and ground truthing and, and relationships. Um, on the Twitter data, just a quick one. There's actually been some interesting studies of, of the sampling bias in Twitter users, and um, it's actually um, it, it it seems to be interestingly representative of many groups that are under tend to be underrepresented in census data. So you have um, low-income communities of color are disproportionately likely to use Twitter, which is really interesting. So, but the but the answer in terms of, of sampling is that you have to always combine all these sources of data. I don't think you can use Twitter alone. You can't. We're not going to be able to use the census alone. We're going to start kind of meshing all of these into one neighborhood, one, one um, 
narrative. Um, so it's it's what we call multiple uh, cobbling together multiple partial perspectives as a way of, of kind of validating all these different data sources, which are each quite flawed. was gentrification is a uh, process and not an event. Yeah. Um, and I think that might be just kind of a hard concept to really kind of wrap your head around. And I'm wondering, have you ever thought um, that your research could also incorporate um, some type of uh, overlay that shows the multiple, um, I don't know if in indicators are the word, but, but the multiple, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that have shifted um, and created the gentrifying effect. And, and I say that because um, yes, you can say that, well, transit stations don't cause gentrification. But then you have to look at what is the surrounding development around that. So see that as an overlay. And then what are any corresponding um, policies that are overlaid on top of that? You know, and what are other types of initiatives or um, or or things that kind of create that gentrifying effect over time? Because all of those all of those initiatives don't happen at one time. You know, they are a process and a buildup of events and activities that. Um, aren't mitigating gentrification, but that are um, kind of causal effects. Yeah, no, you've done a great job of portraying. This is just so very complex. And I mean, the factors that you're naming, the neighborhood context, the policies, the individual experiences, the patterns uh, of you know, where people walk in the neighborhood, all these things, right, combine into this experience of, of the neighborhood, which then shapes how the market behaves. And there's even another one that, that fascinates me is redlining. Um, and in, in the case of transit, too, um, you know, thinking about where, why the transit stations are what, where they are. So maybe that transit station, you can't, in your simple, you know, 10-year-long regression model, find gentrification. But, but that transit line, you know, transit lines are typically put through the path of least resistance. They're put through low-income communities, and they're put through uh, industrial areas. And so that history then has shaped all what's going on around the station um, and uh, what subsequently happens. So, you know, it, it, it's so, I, you know, I don't know whether in my lifetime we'll be able to capture all these complexities in our, in our research and certainly, certainly using mixed methods and qualitative and quantitative helps helps um, some of it, but you know, if, if we can just slow down the economists, um, that would be, I would be happy with that. <laughs> the ones that use that metropolitan level data and look at 100 metros and then say they've figured out how everything works. Because they're missing all that, those you know, rich contextual factors, which are really what, the one, what matters. Thank you so much for your analysis. It's been really wonderful to continue learning from you as you proceed with your evolution of your ideas and understanding of this work. Um, there are competing narratives, and what we do, I, I don't know, so we have a local uh, researcher here too who is also looking at these issues. Uh, Will Stansel just came out with a new analysis that yes, right. highlights the um, national trends on this work and, and their claim is that it's more the issue is still concentrated poverty versus gentrification 
Do you have any critique on that research? I don't know if you've been able to um, be exposed to it. This is the Atlas of Neighborhood Change. That yeah, I did. I saw the City Lab story, and I didn't get a chance to dig into the research. But the, so this is a common um, schism, though. But um, between see, yeah, this is where you might have to weigh in because you're so good on this. But the, I mean, <laughs> so much to say on this particular topic. But but so and, and there's a set of folks. So. So it, it, the thing is, it's true, right? We have, and I said it in my talk too, we have much more, many more communities in decline than we have gentrifying. gentrifying. Gentrification is a very small piece of the puzzle. It gets a hugely disproportionate share of the debate. It's sort of an easy way, it's a low hanging, it's low hanging fruit. So we can, we look at it so that we don't have to deal with the dire poverty and the decline because we don't know what to do um, in those uh, cases. So yeah, so 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 those the you know the I think the overall argument is right, but uh, that in terms of the numbers, um, but it doesn't make it even uh, it doesn't make it less uh, important. It's just that you can think of it as sort of a different kind of violence. That the gentrification and displacement is a is a is a local violence. Um, concentr local concentrated poverty inequality. Neighborhood decline generally is national violence and neglect, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's almost a different, it's almost apples and oranges. One important point I think you hit on was the need to think like private developers, because I think with a lot of this gentrification work and our efforts to predict what's going to be happening, we're just trying to catch up with what private developers have been thinking about for a decade. Are there ways to kind of combine the typical, typical public data that you rely upon with more private data to get a more complete picture of what they're thinking? So you know what? There's actually they are already doing this. There was a wonderful article um, I, uh, in, and I can't remember. It was an architectural periodical about um, a number of different businesses that have uh, that are interested in real estate investment that have gathered together all the private data sources that we always dream about and they're meshing them into one huge predictive model of gentrification and selling it to brokers so that they can <coughs> then tell where, uh, particularly middle class uh, neighborhoods where they can go and buy it and make, um, make money. Um, so, um, so it's already it's already happened, and I, you know, I don't know if we will ever. <coughs> the one thing I've thought about is that you know, could we, could we collaborate in some way? You know, it's not, it's ultimately it's not in the private sector's interests to to um, create division in communities. I mean, can we make an argument like this? Maybe it's idealistic, but. Um, that's that's what I would hope for. Is we could we could find a way to share data because we're not going to have it by ourselves. The models that they put together seem to be so fulfilling as well. Yes. That's an advantage they have that we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> they can make their change happen. to gentrify, but that did not gentrify. Did you find any any patterns among them or commonalities? Um, yeah, uh, I would. Uh, well, we, we the, it, it's a diverse set of 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 reasons. Um, sometimes, so we have certain factors that come up significant in almost every model. For, um, and this is in both San Francisco and our New York models. Um, it's things like his presence of historic housing um, um, and uh, walkability. Um, 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 one, if if you have households with children, you're actually less likely to gentrify everywhere. 
Um, I, I call it the, the biggest anti-displacement policy would be to have, to have children everywhere. Uh, apparently, <laughs> people see the kids in the neighborhood and they, they, they don't want to move in. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so, but, so, then, so then you get these false positives, particularly with historic housing, so not, I mean, this is census data, right, on how old the structure is, so not all old housing is alike, and you have this crap, you know, housing built around World War II, the census doesn't break it down, right, below, uh, before 1950, so you, you have this, you know, sort of a mix of that crap housing built in the later period with a mu much more uh, solid, elegant housing stock from the, 19, the teens and 20s. So, yeah, so that's one of the reasons we're getting, it's just, it's a, it's a data issue, I think, in part, that, that is messing it up. Things don't mean the same. Historic housing in some neighborhoods, you know, has a different meaning than in other neighborhoods. Again, this is all about, it's the context, right? We have time for one more, one more question down here. Hi, um, thank you for um, for being here with us. Uh, I just kind of had a um, kind of specific question about. Uh, I wonder if you have any research or found in your research the, the interaction between gentrifying um, neighborhoods and how it. In, influences um, school districts because I, I just sort of from personal experience have seen neighborhoods where there's a lot of young professionals who move in and then they get to that age where they're starting families and um, they don't find the schools that they um, would expect from their sort of um, middle class or upper class backgrounds. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if there are any trends that you've seen as sort of um, gentrification evolves and sort of how that impact school funding and policy and change. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a really huge, a huge question. And yeah, so I should have mentioned one of the variables that almost always comes up significance is presence of people 25 to 34 years old. And, and then people then people have been having their kids later, right? So they're having in, um, it's, they're in their late 30s and 40s, and then uh, that's when it 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 all um, changes. So 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 the so the for for the most part, you know, gentrifiers are not. Um, well, it, it sort of depends again on the area, but gentrifiers are not having the kids, and so they're not impacting the schools. <laughs> um, but that that's in the in the core areas, right? And. Um, but in the even in the more residential areas, I would think of, of Minneapolis. You have, um, or, or even just right outside Minneapolis, and you have you have um, gentrification going on. Um, that is actually people seeking schools for the for the first time. So these these are like these different forms of of, uh, of gentrification, and and you have a huge impact. I mean, I this is completely anecdotal, but we you know. We, in the, just from knowing myself with the Berkeley Public Schools and what, as that area has gentrified, it's wreaked havoc with our integration program. So we have the, one of the best school integration programs in the country, and now we don't have any kids of color anymore. Um, so, um, and so we, we actually have to rethink it on a regional level to make it work. Um, so it's resegregating schools. So, so there's some interesting new dissertations coming out on gentrification of schools. So I don't know if they are out yet, but if, if you Google, you may find them. So I want to thank uh, again Karen for being here today and remind uh, everyone that there are um, snacks and like <laughs> drinks uh, in the uh, atrium and we can continue the conversation. But thank you very much. <laughs>